Welcome. This is the October 25th Jail and Zones call. We briefly had Daniel. He might return. We have Rod G. We have Antrenig, Jan, and Goran, and myself, Michael. Hopefully others will trickle in. Daniel just joined as I said that. Welcome back, Daniel. Uh, quick question, uh -huh. Jan, did anyone show interest in making, say, a port of your WireGuard script? Um, I think you mentioned that Alan uh, recommended this way to take so that yes. it becomes available in 14, and I'm sure I could package it as a port, uh, and then it would be easily available for 13.2, and the difference between supporting 13 and 14 is just a one-line change because the module has been renamed. The rest should just work. Can that be an if yeah. def, or does it take two scripts? It would be a trivial thing to do in a port, something. Okay. Uh, and it could even be detected uh, by looking at the uh, kernel version. And okay. then just read a CTL and use one or the other. It's really three bytes difference in, this, in a string. Is there an if underscore in front of a module name, or is it just wg? Uh, so that's... Uh, not, uh, but uh, there has been a request to basically what to do with it uh, in the original bug report I submitted a few days ago. Someone wanted to use this instead of W uh, quick. Okay. Uh, uh, but he kind of likes what I intentionally left out, and that is he likes that the original one uh, does um, put in. Uh, interface routes for all the allowed IP addresses. Okay. But it does so much more and worse things that it basically becomes a very inefficient daemon monitoring the routing uh, table changes via a routing socket by parsing the output from route monitor in a shell script. And for every change, it dumps the whole routing table again to inspect the state. So it's basically n square uh, overhead doesn't scale. And all of this is done to basically, if there is uh, an allowed IP which overlaps with a peer endpoint, it installs a host route to exempt the peer endpoint address from a WireGuard tunneling so that you don't block yourself, for example, by putting in a default route. Um, so basically, if you put in a default route, this will result in it putting in a host route for your endpoint address over your original host route and then overriding that with two slash uh, one routes and stuff like this. Um, it's really nasty code and I refuse to implement this part of it, but uh, the just giving easy access to the uh, routing uh, information, basically that's important and that's missing so that someone can populate one of the three BSD routing tables. You can have multiple ones per VNet I see. Uh, with it. Uh, and then you can avoid such conflicts by making sure to use the right routing table for the right things, or even using two VNets where, with the underlay and the overlay in different VNets, uh, which also completely resolves this problem. So you have two clean alternative solutions. Uh, one fits different use cases than the other. Okay. Uh, but right now, as it is, someone would have to repass the configuration because there isn't. I don't uh, extract this information from the configuration, but there's basically the same code which already exists to handle the uh, um, the interface IP addresses and to collect them all because you can have multiple lines with address equals and then a comma separated okay. list of addresses to add stuff like that. So, and it would be the same code for uh, allowed IP addresses to just collect them up, uh, a trivial change. Okay. And then that, the user has easy access to this uh, in the hook. That all sounds like more reason for a port in so far as we're almost talking policy. Uh, you no, know, we're talking the mechanism for the user to express policy without having to redo a third of a script. Okay. The the policy is in the hand of a user. I exactly, I refuse to force policy on the user. Good. Excellent. Do you have a link well, to I the should give them the tool to, to uh, express the policy without having to do all the text processing again? Got it. Do you have a link to the most recent version? 
um, there are no changes uh, okay. made yet. Uh, the latest version is still the one listed in the bug report. Okay, so it's still a report rather than a gist, rather than a review, correct? No, wait, uh, they reference the same code. Okay. Uh, and there, I put in a PR, uh, sorry, uh, a review as well, but that ref they are linked to each other, so you can find one from the other. I will try to do that as we speak. Okay, uh, why are they? Um, uh, Daniel, do you have any topics? And welcome, Dan, the other two Dans. One thing I would, when I revisit the script for 14, which I would like to add, which would be uh, unavailable or would have to be implemented differently on uh, uh, 13, is support for basically delegating the uh, WireGuard interface to, the, to a jail directly. So I'm now that FreeBSD 14 has the dash J flag for F config and route, uh, those commands on the host can be used to inject routes and IP addresses into a Dell interface or into a VNet and then modify there so that you could have basically a new uh, interface setting, which would be something like jail or whatever, or VNet. I don't know which one would fit better. And probably VNet. And then if you assign it to VNet, the interface wouldn't just be created, it would also be uh, moved over to this uh, um, VNet okay. after the configuration has been applied. And that was uh, on fconfig j? Uh, yeah, I have config j and route has the same flag. Okay. If I think net start as well. He says, I'm not certain if net start made it into 14, but a route and I have config did. The other problem is that uh, I found out that there's a problematic corner case where basically right now you have uh, in the jail command an exec dot uh, pre start which runs before the jail is created. You have exec dot created which also runs on the host after the jail has been created. Okay. But there, there's nothing to basically hook into after the jail has been created and the interfaces um, have been uh, moved over via uh, uh, vnet.interface. The next thing which happens that you can hook is uh, exec.start, which is inside okay. the guest, oh, jail. And, yep. uh, oh, Jamie just joined. Yes, yeah, so let's go into that detail perhaps yep. a little later. Uh, so, Quick question, yeah, either Daniel, do you time. have agenda items? No, I don't. You're not a Daniel. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Jamie. Oh, uh, I thought I, you said either of you. No. <laughs> no, no, we've got two Daniels. They rolled in. Uh, awesome. Uh, Jamie, any news or uh, things to report? No, nothing, nothing. at all. Uh, did, did the release notes get some love? Um. I assume so. I have not checked, but I mean, you know, okay. I I got an email saying, oh, yeah, I'm collecting release notes, and so I sent it on. Assume it's there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So I know, Goran, if you can be efficient, you wanted to hear uh, Jamie, uh, you want Jamie to hear your report on your NV list work. Do you have the abbreviated version of that? I'm wrapping, sorry. No problem. I'm wrapping up and retreat. So it's going to be covered with text, so I know it it works, kind of. And uh, if we assume that that's implemented already. Can you be any uh, louder? Am I louder now? Uh, Jamie, can you hear him adequately? Um, It's not really volume. It's just kind of mushy. Kind of mushy, yeah. yeah. Do what you can. Okay. So the what we need to decide is on the kernel and the user space side what we want to do, and we have three choices. Either it's going to be array of bytes, or it's going to be NV list, which is really really bad, or it's going to be NV tree so that we allow filtering to be quicker. Uh, basically, we have to answer that question for separately for kernel and user space, because I doubt that the user space will be a stream of bytes. 
we were kind of working with it in, in the user space, but the kernel can just store it and uh, and we'll let the user space do do the magic. So Jamie, I'm kind of leaning towards having NV3 everywhere once it's accepted, but what what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is on the user space side, I'm really in favor of it being a text string, something that works in a jail configuration file, something that works in a command line, something that you do not need to have a program that specially does that data type. And that would suggest that on the kernel side, then it would be in some sort of a name value tree or something. Okay, I mean, we we can decide on the kernel later. Uh, if we are set on the user space, let me experiment and see what we can get out of it. Uh, Young, the RB is already used in the NV tree, and that's the base of the structure I created. Anything to elaborate well, on, Jan, related to that? Um, but the, I would object, even if I'm in no position to object, uh, to uh, having a single big state per jail to be patched. Instead, I would just say, keep it a flat namespace of printable names with arbitrary blobs as values, potentially. Uh, of course, size limited to something which isn't a problem for the kernel to keep a hold of. And yeah, and because of that, the original idea with having a single NV list per uh, jail and then basically having system calls to patch the state of this single NV list per jail is uh, really, uh, in my opinion, very bad design. Uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, just keeping it, what Jamie recommended is uh, a lot more sensible and more scripting friendly than having to always deal with uh, nested structures and uh, binary formats. It should be uh, shell friendly. But that doesn't mean that the payloads of the values should have to be uh, text or printable anyway, because sometimes you need a little blob like a war key or something to uh, store there. Basically, if you limit yourself to strings using the NV tree, it's already implemented. I mean, I already done that. What do you mean by NV tree? Uh, I know there's lib NV, there's lib NV pair, but what is NV tree? Elementary is the structure I'm working on. I have to give it some name. Okay. I mean, MV list is implemented via tail queue, which is a list, and this is implemented with RB, which is a tree. So I kind of thought that's a appropriate name, really. Yep. Do you have a syntax example that might clarify that? Uh, syntax of what? Of of what NV tree would look like to help communicate how it's different from RB tree. Oh, uh, not yet. I started writing a man page, and it's going to be documented. But the uh, it's it's all basically in the FreeBSD base already. Uh, the the tail queue and the RB, which are the structures. Well, set of macros that are uh, helping implement the the linked list on one side, which is MV list, right, and uh, binary tree, which is MV tree. So it's used that RB and tail queue are used around the FreeBSD code a lot, so we know it's battle tested. Okay. I mean, my code isn't, but the the Set of macros I just mentioned are really well tested. 
Any questions for Goran? Although you just posted one, why do you use both RB tree and tail queue? Because you can have um, arrays and nesting in envy list, and I'm keeping the packed form uh, compatibility between envy list and envy tree. Does that if, answer your question, John? Yeah, is that an answer? Mm, not a complete one. I would have to look at the code because uh, a red black tree can already do a name to uh, value mapping intrusively linked, and I don't know why you would need uh, anything more than a name to uh, value mapping inside the kernel for this. But I will just look at the code. Uh, if, I just have to dig it out of Fabricator. <laughs> okay, well, do connect offline on that. Um, do keep us posted. Let's okay. see. Anything else go on? Well, I just marked the, uh, in a spreadsheet and most of the stuff that I would like to work on. And those are basically two categories. Uh, one is uh, jail to automatically create VNet and assign it uh, to, to appropriate jail. And the second one is basically a daemon in the user space that we do, well, a lot. Uh, but based on UCL, based on EnvyList or Envy3, we will see along the way uh, and so on. Yesterday I talked to Dave, and there is an idea to have uh, not just JLD, but a daemon that would manage Beehive and jail from a single, well, from a user's perspective, it's a single interface. I kind of oh, like Oh, zone CTL, basically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something, something like that. But I really like the idea that you can control resources, virtual resources of your FreeBSD with the one tool. It's kind of neat. Is that one and the same as Yon state tracking or is that completely unrelated? No, that would be something different. Okay. Or a super set of that. And Yon, you're in design phase on that as I understand? Uh, well, the design is, is done. Um, no, it's up to implement the proof of concept. No, it doesn't need a proof of concept, but the prototype needs to work. Okay. And I've spent my copious free time uh, on something else. Okay, understood. Uh, so, um, I know I have a little demon with all the usual boilerplate to write a, write a KQ uh, event loop and stuff like this uh, with the added complexity that I have to think very carefully whenever there's a system call which can fail because uh, as I said, the design is done and I have basically these operations connecting to the daemon, which okay. is allowed to fail for resource exhaustion reasons, for example, uh, registering a new state by name that is of course a memory allocation so it can fail, then registering a subscription by specifying a pattern to match against the state names. Uh, that again requires a memory allocation so it can fail, even if you're connected. And once you're connected and the states are created and so patterns subscribe to them, the following operations must never fail except if we peak is nine the demon or something. That's to Notify that a state uh, has been updated. Okay. Um, wait for notifications uh, on your already subscribed uh, to uh, things. Uh, destroy a created state uh, and close your connection. Okay. At this point, uh, please, I hope the three of you can be in touch. You, Dave, and uh, Goran all related on your related daemons so we don't have incompatible uh initiatives and uh jan not to doubt your skills uh please no uh but uh while implementing can you also have a look on the illumos uh, zone uh, utility because they've had a demon since day one 
and uh, I know it's, it's... that they do, but yeah. what they do is so much more that it's a completely different concept. Um, what they do is they had, took a holistic approach. It took them several many years to get a working prototype. And it's a very complicated beast and they are a bit more forgiving about uh, assuming that certain things will just not happen in real life as I am. I'm a bit more um, pedantic about never allocating resources, which you can't do if you have to exchange XML messages uh, and pass and emit XML. And I want to keep the protocol as simple and um, single purpose as possible. Okay, please connect offline as appropriate. And for those who are flies on walls, a bunch of this has been sort of invigorated by the announcement of the found FreeBSD Foundation's Enterprise Working Group. They have published video recordings of their meetings, which I believe are in the previous minutes of this and or the Beehive call. And if you've read the invitation to this call, I have done what I can to consolidate, update, and refresh in what was a wish list, which became a to-do list for 14, which became a list of categorized and gently, politely uh, prioritized uh, topics such as we definitely need help cleaning up the web networking resources because we often have the tools people want. They're not well documented. Uh, storage is a hot topic. All the various helpers out there. Thank you, Daniel, for NetGraph Buddy. Um, process supervision. It sounds like we have a little update on that in the next few minutes. Uh, jail PID separation to allow for Docker. Ansible is a whole topic of all its own. And thank you, Jan, for your input there. And I know that uh, Patrick... Housen has interest in that. Chuck Tuffley is working on OpenStack. That was a surprise. I did run some quick polls on that. We touched on TPM emulation earlier before the recording. I've just heard that 9P client work should, re should reinvigorate this week. Uh, VNC security, that's a different topic to address. No one's shown interest in that beyond the concern and other topics. So. In the big picture, when it comes to the foundation, things like line rate, line rate 10 and 40 gig networking are a huge question. And thank you, Jan, for talking to Christoph Provost in Coimbra. And state tracking, which we just touched on, broadly an API so that we're not all reinventing tools all the time. Uh, as John D made a point on the last enterprise call, Work, working group call, uh, it is say uh, live migration that uh, that separates the toys from the commercial enterprise products. So uh, I have reached out to various folks on the status of their work, but please take a look at this document. Uh, several people wondered where the heck Beehive ARM64 is, and that's not super clear because there was activity in March. Uh, John D also mentioned uh, pluggable network and storage frameworks because, hey, he's working on a libNFS client, but this is all getting a bit beehivey. And of course, always documentation. So please look at this list that uh, Dave kindly built and, and Goran is referring to, and they are both linked here, and maybe they'll get merged. I cannot say, but uh, that's an interesting initiative, and I'm curious, is anyone else here going to be at the Vendor Summit on the 2nd of November? Uh, online, I'm guessing, on Entrenic, I'd love to see you in San Jose. That would be fantastic. Anyway, um, I know that Entrenic and Jan have uh, news on process supervision, and Antrenig wants to give a jailer control demo along with basic jailer demo for feedback. Uh, does anyone have other topics to slip in before we jump into those? Or any questions regarding the enterprise working group? And I see a bunch of chat. I will try to catch up on that. Uh, let's jump into a 
quick report on process supervision. Yantrenig, who which one of you want to uh, give us a report? So I'll, I'll start, but <coughs> Jan. Keep him honest. Okay. Apologies. Jan, feel free to jump in whenever you want. Um, so so um, the, the, the story is that the enterprise working group customers, I think is a valid word right now, uh, had an issue where, okay, how do we supervise Beehive? Because there's the Beehive utility, there's Beehive control, there is also utilities such as VM Beehive that are, you know, very standalone, but they don't do any process supervision. Did Beehive crash? Does it need to reboot? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, for those who are interested, yes, they, according to them, they did have a look at things like CBSD and other utilities. However, those utilities are very much more like a framework than the utility. Let's put it that way. Antrenic, will this be jail specific or purely Beehive? Uh, this one is purely Beehive, okay. the one that I'm working on that Jan started. Yep. So the one that Jan started and uh, passed to Michael, then Michael passed to me, and hopefully we'll pass it tomorrow to the enterprise working group in the Beehive call, is basically a, um, a, a, a Runit script. For those who are not familiar, Runit is a uh, init system uh, that is daemon tools compatible. Okay. Um, it's also default in many Linux operating systems, such as Void Linux, which has its roots in NetBSD, one would say. Um, and uh, it has a very simple uh, <coughs> scripting and management interface to use. And uh, so unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on who you ask, the, um, the, the management utility that we are building does rely on Runit. Okay. And Runit will be um, uh, run via RCD, <clears throat> our in script or via uh, TTYs, depending on the situation. We'll figure out that part today. Okay. And the end result, yes. Uh, excellent, but very beehivey. So let's uh, finish up that summary for everyone to get them thinking because mm -hmm. it is actively going. And then let's jump into your jailer demo. Yes. So, um, so what yeah, might that's the... the overall. Okay. Uh, show of hands, is anyone using any of those classic tools like Daemon Tools, Run It? S6RC, which Jan has been uh, sharing yes, good yes, love for yes. over the years. Yes, yes, and yes, what was that? Demon tools, but not the others. Ah. I use Fresh Ports originally used Daemon tools. I, I went, I changed those scripts so that they use uh, Daemon from base now. Got it. Have you found limitations in Daemon and base? No. Got it. Because I know um, the, on, the only. <laughs> The only uh, limitation is that it works completely different on every operating system you go to that has a daemon command, but uh, it's great. I think the FreeBSD one is by far the, my, I mean, it's the best version, in my opinion. Jan, do you have a short answer on what you feel it's missing in base, which being Ooh. hours it could be built upon? You have uh, you can basically only communicate with it through signals. You can't see its state. You it, while it can forward logs to syslog, uh, that's about all it can do with I/O redirection. Yeah, you oftentimes need a script on both ends of it, <laughs> basically, and you have to go through pit files, which is inherently racy and unreliable and doesn't nest well. But hey, it is what it is. It can be made to work, but not there's no good way to control yeah to control it. Uh, monitor it. It's just a way to get software demonized, which normally, in my opinion, shouldn't even be your goal. You well, okay. should go for keeping the processes under supervision instead of just having them demonized off and then you have to go and hunt them down and pull for them. Okay. Are there base components that rely on it? Uh, yes, I think there are a few RC.d scripts uh, in base, which uh, do uh, just grab for it in etc rc.d. Got it. I'd be, I'd be um, curious if there are like success stories or horror stories. It, it's not that a tool which calls for horror stories, it's just that its design is a little bit uh, too simple. Got it. Ah. Uh... 
Thank you and welcome, Chris. I did give a little summary on the Enterprise Working Group. I don't know if you heard that. And uh, Antrina gave a preview of some work that he and Jan are doing related to process supervision. Uh, for those flies on the wall, would you like Chris to give a quick intro to what the group is up to? Show of hands or show of nods? Chris, are you open to doing that? Else we get an, a jailer demo and jailctl demo. Sure, I can uh, cool. give a quick rundown. Um, sorry for being late. Um, no worries, no pressure on this. I call. had another event, uh, another call just before that. So um, basically, what is new? Um, <laughs> I guess you could probably tell me more uh, than me probably at the moment, uh, because since the last call, not really that much has changed. I've updated the PRD with the contents and the, uh, the inputs that we received from uh, our previous call from Friday with uh, Michael Ozipov and Johannes Kunde. Um, right. I've started to prepare the presentation, the slide deck for the upcoming call on Friday for the Enterprise Working Group. And I understand that Antronik um, is looking at Shaler to um, address the things that were discussed during the call on Friday last week. So um, I will be looking at the recording, I think, to follow up and understand what you guys have been talking beforehand. And... Otherwise, I don't really have that much news. I can tell you what we're doing with the Enterprise Working Group in general and what the work stream is focusing on that I'm working on with the Beehive and Jails management. But I think you seem to be having a grip because you've been already talking about a couple of things from what I can read. Is that right? Uh, somewhat accurate and appreciated. Uh... I don't see a call invite, but we can talk about that offline. Let's see. I see. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Is that something that all are welcome to join as per the chat or Oops. by selective invitation? Uh, sorry, I was having uh, issues with the connectivity. I think you no were asking whether uh, the call on Friday is open. Um, yeah, the call on the chat Friday is, there a link is to open. That? Cool. Uh, oh, you're cutting out. Okay, I think I have that documented somewhere. I don't have the link in the Enterprise Working Group and the Google Groups. So if you have signed up, uh, you will receive that uh, once he sends that out. But I will check really quickly. And if I have one, then I will happily post it in the chat. Okay. And uh, Jan has posted in chat with his email address. So perhaps use that. It sounds like you want to join, and I think the time zones work well for you, unlike some of us. Yeah, Chris, your video is freezing. So uh, interject with anything else, but Antrina, go ahead and rig up for a demo. And I'll try to Can find everyone... the PRD document. Sounds good. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll be giving a demo that I've been wanting to give for a long time. Um, this is <laughs> not the definitive demo. Uh, I'll just be showing what I've been do I've been doing lately, and I would love to get your feedback to improve the utility that I'm building. Let's see if you can uh, see my screen. Okay, uh, is the quality good? Well, I can see myself in my windows computer. Not bad. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good. I can maximize a bit as well. And there you go. Okay. Uh, this is a Mac system. You can ignore that. Uh, this is a FreeBSD system. This is, oh, that's interesting. So Zoom is not doing the other tab of my terminal. That's not uh, cute, Zoom. I see four tabs on my version. I know, but when I change the tab, it doesn't actually change the tab in the screen. That's okay. uh, Maybe that uh, your terminal emulator uses one window from the window exactly. ecosystem right. point of view yeah for reasons uh can you just use tmux inside a single window or something I on can. the host yes 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 i absolutely can i will do that indeed so uh let's do it this way uh, i'll keep this one here i'll have a tmux there 
uh, this is the Mac, and let's have a uh, SSH dev BSD, I want to say 15. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I hope it's all visible. Okay. So this is actually a free BSD current, the latest snapshot. I actually haven't done anything on this. So the, <clears throat> the utility that we started building a while ago is actually called Jailer. Uh, this has a long story in our company. Um, it, we do use it internally in our production systems as well as inside of our product. The history goes that we started building this with uh, uh, Erlang and Elixir, and then we had a bet that I can rewrite this in 14 days, as in the Erlang Elixir version to a shell version. Of course, the bet was that if I am able to do it, I will open source it. And if I cannot do it, then I will give my chair to my co-founder, which my chair was the best at the time in the office. And as you can see, I won the bet. Um, so on the GitHub, you can see a whole big readme. At the, we don't have man pages right now. I'm sorry for that. But if any of you can help me to write the man pages, I will be glad to integrate it. Um, core concepts of Jailer, it runs on FreeBSD. Uh, requires 13.2 or uh, soon it will also work with 14's dot include feature. It requires ZFS. Um, I know that many people uh, are not happy about this uh, because a lot of the cloud providers don't give ZFS instances. Although to be fair, now that Mac image currently can generate a ZFS image, we might be able to talk with the cloud providers to make sure that all the free BSDs everywhere on the cloud also work with ZFS. Otherwise your solution is to basically do a truncate. So, you know, it's not that bad to do that. And um, currently it uses my patch on 13.2. However, on 14, it will not patch the jail in it uh, RCD. It's, by the way, it's just a single line of difference. There's nothing else. Uh, it starts with doing something such as jailer in it, which I have done here. Uh, it will start asking you questions. And uh, the first question that I think I can show it in the readme, that might be even cuter. Uh, when you start asking a jailer in it, it will say, this is the data set that I'm going to use, and this is the mount point that I'm going to use. And if you're, if you're OK with that, you can say yes. It will create everything for you and patch the uh, jail service. And after that, you can do cute things, such as jailer init info. Oh, wait, this is the Mac. OK, there we go. Jailer init info with, nope, that's not the correct user. OK, let's try it again. Jailer init info, OK. And you know, is jail enabled? Is it patched? Is jail dear set? What are the stuff? And you can also do jailer init bridge, which will automatically configure a RC con for you. I think I can do tail three, which will add a bridge zero in the clone interfaces and will assign it to an IP with 10.0.0.1 slash 24. Um, this is what it does as soon as you do jailer init bridge. It also has support for jailer in the DHCP. And I haven't tried this in a while, so I don't know if it's even going to work. So what it end up, ends up doing is it will install DHCPD uh, from packages. It will set up DHCPD.conf for the bridge zero, and it will modify the uh, dev FS rules in order to allow you to have the VNet jails use DHCP. Uh, and it will do all of this in the background I haven't run this in a while. Let's see what it does. Hopefully it works. Um, until that's working, let me connect to an actual machine that does use this. This is my home server. And inside my home server, wrong password. And inside my home server, I've been running this for quite a good amount of jails. And at the end result, what Jailer is going to do is that, and we can see what it's going, oh, yeah, there you go, it worked. What it's going to do, you can see what it's going to do using the Jailer create dash D. D stands for Dan, as in, you know, who is Dan here? I hope it is, yes. As in Dan Langiel, that's what stash D stands for. Uh, as in, show me what you are about to do so I can do it myself if needed. Uh, so if you don't give it any arguments, what? What? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, you asked if a jail manager can just tell you what it's supposed to do. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's a good feature. So I just added the dash D. I think it was a tweet like a year ago or something. Um, so yeah, that was the dash D. And uh, if you don't give it any name, it will just go with the defaults and it will show you what it's supposed to do. 
And what it's supposed to do is the following. I think set mouse on is needed. So it's going to create a um, jail config with a random ID. There you go. This is a random ID. Uh, it's going to assign it an ID. This is an internal ID that we use. It's going to use the DataFS rule set. It's going to assign a bridge, a domain that is the host name of the host. Very same configuration here. A very same pre-start, stop, etc. Of what we would expect also creates a var log jail directory for the log of the jails console and persist. Then it would run ZFS send receive. There you go. This is the send and receive. It will copy the result conf. And then because I am using DHCP, it's going to, and I don't know if anyone knows this, there is a, a file in FreeBSD that is called etc or etc start if dot the interface name. You can put anything that you want in there and the RC system will execute this when the interface is being started. This is a good way to hard code a MAC address uh, inside there. And because you're using DHCP, you would want a e pair with a static MAC address rather than changing every time we restart it. And then it will set the RC conf to use the e pair with sync DHCP. And finally, what is this? Oh, there we go. Post installation, it will set the following, which is disable send mail and something about syslog. This is what the FreeBSD default installer does. So I do it here as well. And if I remove the dash D, we're just going to create that. Creating creation. I hope it works, by the way. I, I've never tested on current before. So static MAC address to a clone. I think we could do that. Yeah, and yeah, I would love to get a bunch of you know feature requests today so I can implement those. This is obviously doing um, ZFS send receive underneath. And this is actually running on my Mac as a ARM image inside QMU. Um, and while it's doing that, come on, you can finish it. Can I jump in with account. a question really quickly? Please. Yes. Uh and, and, and on the previous screen, uh, I saw that it, it said that it's going to enable DFFS for Vina. Yes. I'm trying to understand how is that related? Why does it need DFFS? Oh, right. Why does it need and, to uh, change DFFS? For DHCP. Yeah, which it um, just got stuck. So I might have done something wrong, by the way. See, the DH client is stuck. Let me control C this and we'll do it with a static IP for the moment, 10, 0, 0 let's say 15 slash 20, just 15 would be fine. And it will create one with a static IP. Uh, so DevFS is needed for the following. Um, you need to show the ATC, no, sorry, the Dev VPF interface, DevFS. Ah, okay, it's about the rule set. All oh, right, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. there you go. Yeah, so VNet I think I is get it. 10. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. all right, yep. And yeah, it will just unhide that for the okay. system. And Understood. Uh, so yeah, as you see, it worked with a static IP. For some reason, um, it didn't work with the uh, DHCP. I think I just have something wrong in 15, but I will go over it. I just, yeah, there you go. It, it should have worked. Maybe I, I've done something wrong, but I'll check in a bit. So, <clears throat> or maybe the DHCP server isn't running. I have no idea. DHCP, yeah, I will, yeah, there you go. Service uh, DHCP D, I guess, enabled. No. Hmm, maybe it didn't install. So I I, I don't know because again I've, I haven't tested the DHCP feature in a long time. But so that's the basics of Jailer. Um, although I do have a machine where DHCP works, I'll show it in a bit. This is the basics of Jailer. It will actually end up creating the config file. The one that it created is called JLE something E A. Am I on the right machine? Yes, I am. E A, no, A E, apologies. There you go. And this is what it looks like. Um, so, and then if I do jailer list, you would get the following, right? So, uh, obviously, the one that failed uh, is this, and it, you know, it doesn't have an IP because of the HCP, but I'll fix that bug later. Um, so, this is the whole idea of how jailer works. It also has support for uh, create dash type. E pair bridge, net graph, new, as in the old school model, as well as uh, none, which is a jail that uses the host's network stack. The new is separated, the none is shared, like uh, 
a very bad reproduction. Don't ever use the none. And you can always set the default with uh, network use. As you can see, my default is e -pair bridge. Um, that's the important part there. And lastly, if you do jailer create help, it does have a good help. Uh, the dry run, as we talked about, you can specify a free BSD version if you have it. It does have a bootstrapping process. I'll show that in a second. You can specify a snapshot. You can make it less noisy. So this will disable things like Chrome, etc. cetera. Uh, you can set the domain. By default, is the host name of the uh, host, the network type, like I talked about. And finally, with dash B, you can specify to which bridge to attach to. Obviously, the default is bridge zero because we do create that. Uh, with dash G, you can specify a gateway. If you don't specify a gateway, as you see, I didn't a minute ago, it will take, it will set the bridge as the gateway. So, you know, we're doing a very typical network there or the net mask, if you want to specify net mask, otherwise it will use the network mask of bridge zero and an IP address. Uh, you can run this, however, to be fair, on a system that is attached to the public internet. So this is my ZNC server that does have a public IP address. Um, and the, you know, the, the gateway that my ISP provided for me. So you can do this with the create command as well. Um, and uh, lastly, jailer um, image list. There you go. This, these are the images. And you can also do jailer image use and specify the default. Um, these are the basic commands of jailer that I, they, they work all the time. There are some things that we have, but they don't work all the time. <laughs> It needs more testing. It works in our production environment because we have very, you know, it's opinionated for our system, but we will modify the code to make it work for everyone. And uh, the last bit is that you can also do NAT list, NAT add, NAT delete, uh, redirect list, redirect add, and redirect delete, which will modify the pfconf file for you. Uh, for the internals of that, however, you can check, I'm guessing it's somewhere in here. You can check the readme or the PF stuff. And uh, we, we I think I should also add something like jailer init PF, which will do everything for you basically. But uh, that's the <coughs> basic idea on how it works. So it's pretty um, intrusive if you let it be correct. And you can override with just flags and point at your existing configuration. Exactly. For example, okay. the jailer in it that does the init process, you can give it things. I think that's the only man page that we have, by the way. Jailer, <laughs> I remember we had something like that. Okay. Or at least one of my, um, wait, I'm on the wrong machine. Okay. <laughs> man jailer in it. There you go. You can specify dash D data set, dash M mount point. And override all that. Years. Okay. Exactly. And I'll be adding these flags for the DHCP, for the PF, for and everything else. <clears throat> so the user would have full control. Again, the model of the jailer is it's Unix. Let's just modify text files. Like that, that's the whole model. And use everything that FreeBSD base has. Um, and we are actually proud that we also have something stupid such as this. We use Lua. Don't ask me why. Um because some things are very complex in shell, we thought it would be a good idea to just write it in Lua. And because FreeBSD now has Lua, you know, shipped in it, it made complete sense to have this. Um, so yeah, that's, for example, finding the next ID available. So uh, in, in shell, we would find the largest number, let's say ID equals 15 for e pair 15, and we would add one. But you might have deleted a jail somewhere. And let's say you have eight to uh, 14 available. So it would make sense to use the eight yep. rather than the. Been so this the... is a, yeah exactly. So this is a, a um, way to fix that. Yeah, you okay, have some questions, questions such as I networking. have a question. Why do you have a jail manager ID, which is a small integer, separate from the jail ID? Well, the jail ID changes uh, unless right? you assign it. <clears throat> Yeah, but I don't want to assign a jail ID. We know how dangerous that can go. Instead, it's not I'm dangerous using... at all. You want me to always assign the jail ID? No, it's not dangerous. I, I, it's just that you don't have to do that. Uh, what you're doing, busy. You're adding a whole level of indirection, which 
as for everything I've seen so far can be avoided. Okay. Either by assigning static jail IDs, which uh -huh. is only a problem if something else could block your jail ID by taking it up. Uh -huh. Because you cannot reserve a range of jail IDs. Yeah. That would be a neat, trivial little feature to basically have the auto allocation start at some higher number so that you can uh -huh. reserve the lowest 100,000 or so yeah. for a manual assignment. Yeah. Uh, but the other part is that for network interfaces with renaming network interfaces, you can just embed at least the up to 15 first characters of the jail name in to derive the uh, interface yes. name. And then you can use embedding instead of mapping between different namespaces. Yeah, so that is something that I do want to work on, which is specifically, uh, let's see if I can do it in here. Yes, jailer, oh, let's rather do it this way. So now you have, you know, e pair one, two, three for jail with not jail ID, but the jail with the ID one, two, three in its config file. Grab mm -hmm. ID, etc. jail con these. Well, that's a lot of ID, by the way. All right. So um, the the only reason why I'm using the ID is because of the e pair name. I would love if yeah, I would, but... yeah, if I could do like like e pair um, if config create e pair dash the jail name dash zero a. Um, that makes sense. E pairs are a right. special case because unlike other interfaces. Similar to an NMDM, you get two devices for the price of one. Yes, yes, yes. Or two interfaces. Uh, and so you cannot use the one-step rename, but the one-step rename in RF config isn't really atomic anyway. So mm -hmm. you, and if you just run RF config e pair create, it will pick the next three index. Yes. Uh, and just like a jail ID, uh, by manually assigning that, you are not safe from anyone else taking this name away from you, this e pair yes. interface index. Uh, it's similar to letting the kernel pick the jail ID. So um, here, instead, what you can do is you can create one dynamically and then rename at least one end of it. Mm -hmm. Because what you get if you do run something like uh, IF, uh, as root if config e pair create, it gives you the first one. So you get the e yes. pair zero a for example, and you have to know that there's a second one. I I am actually I would be happy. And in now you can both rename both ends and yes. uh, embed the whatever identifier you stable mm -hmm. identifier for the jail in the interface, mm -hmm. and have it all come up dynamically and uh, put one mm -hmm. end on the bridge and move the other one over into the vnet enabled mm -hmm. jail for example. I would actually be happy in renaming both. My ideal scenario would be something like EP for E pair dash, say the jail name, which would be dub 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 dash yes. zero A zero B. And the reason why I would love to have zero because we've had cases for customers where a jail could have had multiple E pairs. So we had zero A zero B and then one A one B that is attached to another bridge. Right, so mm -hmm. that's also a very common scenario. Uh, of course, the worst part in this naming scheme is that you're limited to 15 characters because you know it's a it's a 16 byte. Uh, um... And the other problem is that it only has to be unique and zero terminated, so you can yes. have a name consisting only of ASCII control characters or uh, backticks. Uh, you can name your interface backtick rm dash rf slash star backtick. Yes, that yeah, all of those are actually very valid. So I don't know if we should double new lines it. in it. Okay. Yeah. Let's not go too deep into that and yes. find a path to showing your new tool, yeah. which seemed to be remote administration. The new tool. Yes. So unless are actually... there any questions at this point? Yeah, any questions and or feature requests or or what I'm doing wrong if you see anything that should be like very much different. Okay. Did no you, sorry. Go ahead, go yes. on. Did you consider using interface group name to map between the jail name and the e pair? That's a very good question. No, I have not yet gotten to using interface groups. I am planning on using that because they are a very useful feature. 
course. And um, what I am having issues with right now uh, regarding using interface groups is, uh, well, it sounds stupid, of course, uh, for anyone who's not using Jailer, is keeping backward compatibility because we do have current customers who do use Jailer. And if I start using that, I might break, I'm not sure if I would or not break something. So let, let me put it just that way. Uh, so I, I still don't know where to go with that. But yes, we are thinking of using uh, um, interface groups for better management, at least like listing which interfaces belong to JLZ, right? So, you know, you could do if config dash G jail uh, foo and see what 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 jail foo's interfaces are so that would be a or which bridge is it attached to maybe even right so th those would be actually very good features yes uh we haven't done that oh which reminds me that i do have a question if i do have a say e pair 3a can i figure out which bridge is it attached to without looking to the bridge does that make sense no you can't no, I can't. So I have over to all bridges and inspect bridges. Okay. the member list. Okay, that would that's a very sad, but that would be very useful. Uh, okay, so these are the stuff in Jailer. Um, um, and the, yes, dear. If you have a, if you trust your tooling, you could use a group uh, you assign. Mm -hmm. So basically, what you would do then is to do a multi-pass approach if you want it to be reliable in the face of crashes and kill, uh, kill processes, you would first assign the interface to uh, a group. And then basically you would look for all interfaces in the group which aren't on the bridge and would add them. So okay. that it's always a, a concatenation of indempotent steps. Uh, first, you make sure that it's in the group, and once it's in the mm -hmm. group, you make sure that everything in the group is a member on that. And basically, mm -hmm. then you can trust it afterward that even if you failed in the first step, the next time you run it, uh, it will converge. Okay. And I, okay, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yes. Um. So this is the uh, last public version of Jailer. We have a new version which uh, which adds a support for IPv6 based on all the things that Jan has taught me, and we also have a jailer file similar to the idea of a Docker file, but the you know the 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 syntax and everything is much different. Maybe I'll talk about that in the coming months, but not today. Um, but yeah, the basic idea is to have a jail management utility that you don't need to touch the jail or the if config or the ZFS command by yourself, but rather it will do it for you. Uh, that's the whole idea. Oh, and uh, of course, I totally forgot jailer list dash J or JSON. Yeah, we do also do that. Um, so this is the basic idea. And then I started getting frustrated because I do have a lot of host machines. And because I have a lot of host machines, I if I want to do anything generated, I have to go to the host machine, become root, then execute a um, you know the jailer commands to manage my jails. That was very frustrating. So yesterday night, uh, before sleeping, I realized that I would love to have a easier way to manage all of these. I will be sharing my other computer. Um, and for a proof of concept, I am going to show a Windows machine. Does it display? Okay, perfect. Now, I've never used Windows before, so if I do something wrong, please don't laugh at me. I'm very sorry. Uh, I, I, honestly, last time I used it was like XP or ME or something. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, enter. Yep, it works. So I created a utility called uh, Jailer CTL, which is also in the same organization, my company's organization. And it's it's a very long shell script that uses SSH to manage things underneath. In this case, I could do Jailer uh, Remote List. You can, no, sorry, Jailer CTL remote list and it will tell you no remotes available use jailer remote add if you don't do anything it will give you a tiny help like this and here's where you can add remote so let's say i want to do a remote add uh, it will need the remote name similar to git let's name it bsdam for my home server and the uh, username and a host so it would be something like my uh, host name is uh, pingvinashen.am and because i am not logging in as 
because I'm not logging in as a root, uh, it does require a pseudo configuration uh, where the pseudo configuration is that user, in this case, Antronic V, should be able to run jlur, the one that I just showed you, uh, without password. So I, for that, I would just add sudo. There you go. I can also add other hosts. So another host that I have is called S0, which lives in s0.local.illuriasecurity.com. And this one, actually, I can log in as a root. So I just add the username there. That's another host that I have. And there's also my home server here in this apartment, which would be in mbp 0 0 dot lock dot Eluria security dot com. This one also doesn't require uh, root. I do use sudo. Of course, the name should be different. This is MBP zero for historical reasons. Actually, it doesn't run on the MacBook Pro, but for some reason, the name is stuck. Okay, so jailer CTL, and I am running this inside Ubuntu on Windows. Like this is portability as much as it could be. You know, I really wanted to manage everything from anywhere. A remote list, I would get the list of remotes. Great. And now I can start doing uh, interesting commands such as jailer inspect. And I have to thank Jan for giving me the idea on how to do this. So um, inspect will inspect the hosts. This is for inspecting the, damn it, jailer CTL. Uh, inspect. Uh, this is going to inspect the host machines. And uh, oh, the, now this is interesting. Turns out the uh, cut command on Ubuntu. It doesn't have a dash W. That's actually very good to know. Is that WSL or, you're using? You mentioned Windows. I am using, yes, I am using Windows subsystem okay, for Linux. This you. is the cut, the cut command with dash W that works on the Mac and works on FreeBSD, obviously, but doesn't work on Linux. I should be thinking about fixing this. Well, for that purpose, I'm just going to, you know, go back here as a, an idea. Okay. Uh, let's go back to make sure we are on the Mac. No name dash right. We are on the Mac. Okay, great. So uh, jailer CTL uh, remote. Uh, I do have remotes here. Yes, I even have multiple remotes, including the one that we just were into. So if I do jailer inspect, I can give it a name for a specific machine, such as PSDIM jailer CTL. Well, I keep doing that. Inspect PSDIM muscle memory, and it will print information: uh, host name, uptime. OS version with the FreeBSD version way, uh, installed kernel, running kernel, running user land, CPUs, load from top, memory from top, jailer dir, uh, which is you know where jailer is running, and number of jails that you're running. If you don't specify a, a remote, it will run on all of them and bring you the output. Maybe a good idea here also would be to add architecture. I just realized that maybe adding architecture would be a good idea. Because, for example, DevBSD here is an ARM machine. Everything else is a uh, x86 machine. Uh, might be useful. Um, that would be useful. Then, yes. Another command that we can have is a list. And you can give it a list of a remote. So I'm going to give it the, S, uh, the DevBSD 15 that we were just in. And it will run the following. It will basically bring the output from there. But most importantly, if you don't give it a remote name, it will bring the output from all of the machines. And maybe a good idea would be to less this. And you will also see on which host is running which jail with its name, the state of it, the JID, the host name, that set, the IP addresses, that set, the gateway, that set. Basically, now you have distributed jail management. Uh, this obviously needs a lot of work. And uh, the final command that you can use is run. You can give it a remote name. In this case, let's do devbsd0 that we came from. And now we can use the jailer subcommands in here. So jailer subcommands, I can do uh, just like we did before, init info, right? Mm, doesn't exist, dev BSD 15, sorry. Yeah, remote doesn't exist. Okay, there we go, right? It will just go there, execute it, bring the output back. You can do init, um, <clears throat> that's init. You can do uh, the list just like we did there, or we can do create. And we can create a new jail. So I'm just going to say address 10, 0, 0, let's say uh, 20, and no username, uh, sorry, no jail name, just create that. And it's going to create that on the dev BSD 15. Uh, and my favorite feature that I realized is okay, so the jail is in the range of 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 
24, my Mac is on a totally different range. I will not be able to uh, connect to this jail technically unless I do port forwarding or I go to the host, then go into the jail. But I can use the console command and then give it the jail name that I just created. And now I am inside that jail. Right now, I am inside that jail without need to go into the host. And uh, Jan's idea was is to integrate the jailer CTL as a subsystem for SSHD, where the user cannot run anything except the jailer as root, uh, which would give you basically Kubernetes style management. Of course, this thing doesn't have any scheduler, but maybe that's a problem for another day. Um, and this is jailer CTL. Uh, I will need I will need to make it more cross-platform on the Linux machines. I promise that. Um, I have no more demos. Any questions? Uh, I had a quick one. Does that only work with jailer managed jails, or can it work with any jail? Uh, so for uh, for listing, it can work with anything because the listing relies on uh, JLS. Okay. Uh, for creation, and the console also works fine. For the creation, you will need jailer. The problem that I just realized when you were asking is that it does use the jailer internal commands. So you will need to have jailer installed. You don't have to use it. But you just Interesting. It. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, although, to be honest, I will be okay into like forking this and making it run the exact same commands without jailer but rather just using the base utilities. So the jail command and the service command in this case, right? Service jail specifically, and the JLS and everything else related to JEXEC, et cetera. So I, I think that's very much doable. It's it's a tiny code. It's like 200 line of shell. I just you know figured it out in the middle of cool. the week. Other questions? Or feature requests would also be fine. I think... Um... You know, the hotness in a jail would be to, especially using ZFS, would be to um, do a snapshot-based updating, which is which is top of mind right now because I'm uh, trying to do that uh, to my jails. Um, I have about 80% of that in the form of a FreeBSD14 jail.conf with uh, nested includes. <laughs> and I that's can actually... Yeah, that's that's probably the right solution, you know. What I then... did is, um, so normally when you try to do this, you uh, hopefully uh, notice in time that you can't rebase uh, ZFS clones. Uh, so either you have to do a full copy per instance, which, okay, if you just ZFS send and receive uh, locally through a pipe, you get a fast copy with a gigabyte or more per second if you put a buffer in between, which is enough to quickly duplicate uh, jails, but it's still a bit wasteful. Uh, so you have to avoid ever modifying clones with uh, persistent data, because uh, that once you have persistent changes in a clone, you can no longer uh, get them out in a good way. But what you right. can Etsy's do the, is yeah. you, Etsy's the only you can hard part, avoid right? the, uh, this ever happen. Uh, and how I do that is to basically prevent by always mounting them with only except doing very specific uh, startup steps, which basically only create the mount points if they're not there, I am to run MKD, and that is done on every uh, pre-start so that I make sure or prepare to make sure that, for example, the user local uh, mount point parent directory and the read-only data set exists. And to get around the unwanted inheritance, because in my first attempt, I uh, got stuck with the problem that I have an immutable, supposedly stateless ZFS data set for my J, which is a read-only clone, which has never been mounted writable. But uh, I can't just delete it, replace it, because my uh, persistent data ZFS data sets were its descendants. So if I do an uh, ZFS remove dash R on it to get rid of it and its uh, children, I have uh, also wiped my data. Um, I wrote uh, a far too complex shell script to untangle this mess. 
to uh, move the old data set out of the way and then basically move over the subtrees I want to preserve and recreate the other ones by cloning the latest version in. But it's a lot better, I think, to completely avoid this unnecessary inheritance or in the tree structure and to have the jail data set be unmountable, just a container, have an other level of unmountable data sets underneath and assign the unmountable child data sets of the jail, the jail mount, uh, the jail directory as mount point property. And then you add the base jail under uh, one of the uh, child data sets by doing your immutable clone and assign it the jail uh, um, path as well as mount point. And all the other ones, uh, inherit their mount point as normally, but they're created under the, these two levels of unmounted parents. Then you have one for the packages, basically, one for your persistent data, is just to keep them apart. And you can just kill all your base jail and your um, packages set, and then recreate it on the next restart. The question is, how do you handle migrating um, your uh, ETC directories and stuff like this across uh, FreeBSD versions? So now I'm thinking about just don't doing that and having them be copied over for every time into a tempfs on start and making them basically write, potentially writable but in thorough so that the jail configuration would always be injected into the, um, on top of the pre-populated tempfs, and normally mounted read only, so that they're really restricted that way. And doing that with uh, just a shell script, I can provision uh, 3BSD 14 jail uh, with a dozen packages in, 400 to 500 milliseconds. That sounds nice. Yeah, that all makes sense. And every time on startup, it will check if the origin is what is configured. And if not, it will just wipe the offending subtrees out of existence. And the next step will make sure that all the required clones exist and clone them on demand on startup. It requires really accepting that the tooling is in control because the tooling will do ZFS destroy dash R. So yeah, either you trust that code or you won't sleep, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you have to trust something somewhere. Yeah, but. Other questions? I have been documenting this as best I can, as as um, Antoinette um, went through all of that. So if you missed something, there are a few the bad page here. Um, if and yeah, now it works on Linux. It, the, the 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 cut they don't support dash w. Of course they don't. Um, but now it works fine. Um, and uh, if anyone has any feature requests or anything else, please feel free the, on the GitHub. My team will be active as much as possible. Um, oh. I am planning, yes, dear. Uh, just uh, about basically this time kind of tooling. One of the problems which has come up in this uh, just round again and again is the problem that the current jail command is a bit fragile, to put it mildly, when it comes to leftover mount points. Uh, so if you do anything in your uh, hooks to mount file systems and uh, you tr especially if you use the um, mount line in your jail con and the file system is already mounted, you have to understand why the jail will not start again if something went wrong and undo oh. the state the jail command doesn't know about. But I found uh, well, I had a uh, really complicated... JQ pipeline to do JSON processing, but found out that uh, just a few days ago that there's a much simpler solution 
because mount dash p gives you the mounted file system exactly. in f stub form. And yes, yes, that I was just going to say that. Processed uh, in uh, shell built ins, which is what I do. So every time you start a jail, the prepare stage, make sure that anything mounted under the um, jail path is unmounted forcefully. Uh, so, so that it doesn't take uh, any uh, offense if uh, you have accidentally left your locking shell in there or something. It will just unmount the file systems and then mount them again on to make sure that they are not in this state where you have to clean up by default. I set all the ZFS uh, data sets to can mount equals no auto so that I can still derive the mount point automatically but the jail.conf is, uh, or its hooks are in charge of mounting the file systems and the post stop will also unmount the file systems again. So we've so, had that problem before, specifically in like you do jail destroy and they're like, oh, busy, but the jail is dead. Oh, it turns out DevFS is stuck in there, right? So it's, it's, it has been a very common problem. Uh, and we've added that in jailer. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, it's not a demon. It can't clean up like on the fly. Right, but if you do jail stop, it will make sure that okay, DevFS is disabled. Uh, if you have a ProtzFS for if it's a Linux jail, etc., well, it will clean those up. And also in the starting, it will make sure it's a it's in a clean environment, except obviously then the the, the uh, except the uh, the root FS, and then then it will start. We've had these issues before, yes. And I would love if Jailer was a demon, but it's not as of now but we would uh, probably want to add a daemon version of it as well. Uh, so there is so, an yeah. alternative, and that is there is the devctl jail uh, kernel module available in from ports. Once you have that module loaded, devd will be informed about jail cha state changes, including uh, the kernel destroying a jail uh, mm -hmm. once the last process died. And you can then run a uh, action in DevD, which could be jailer. The problem is, and I wanted to talk to Jamie about that, is right now there is no way to basically tell the jail command that it should own basically pick up after the jail has been uh, destroyed by the kernel because DevD ha has been told so, and then basically do the post stop and uh, release hooks and whatever other cleanup the jail command would do on a jail-r name. So there's no way to instruct the jail command to pick up after the jail has been destroyed by the kernel. You have to do it manually right now. The more you do through the inclusion of help modular jail.com snippets and exporting uh, variables into the for your hooks to use and so on, the less uh, appealing is it to go the, through the um, through something else in the jail command to invoke your uh, exec hooks. Okay, let's not redesign it on the call. Um, yes. Um, any feature requests on the if anyone has in their mind, uh, Daniel, I heard yours maybe to integrate like snapshot based upgrading or something. Uh, that sounds like a cool idea. Um, and by the way, I forgot there's also jailer snap command which creates a snapshots, and then you can use that snapshot to create another jail. Uh, that 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 also might be useful. Um, do you do a, a deep copy with send receive or a clone? Uh, interestingly, you can specify at the creation. There is uh, two flags, I think, small s and capital S. Small s for uh, clone, snapshot clone, and I think capital S for um, or send receive. Uh, I have to say it's not documented. It's not even in the readme. I do have to add that. That's a good thing that you mentioned, yes. Yeah, you also, uh, as, at least the last time I checked, didn't document why you would pick a bridged over a knotted or routed setup, the requirements to deploy each and how to properly basically take your existing network configuration and make it not or bridge everywhere or completely routed. 
So the main reason for that, because Jan, you live in the future, you have IPv6, you have proper networking, but the majority of people use this uh, very shitty thing called the cloud. And uh, on a cloud environment, on like an out of the box setup, you will either need to do natting, although in IPv6, you can do routing, of course. And uh, uh, currently, uh, if you have, and uh, this is actually on topic, and it's very on topic that we never discussed about, on all of the three major clouds, Google, AWS, and uh, uh, Azure, um, if you just say, like, add the external interface to the bridge, and then you just assign a an IP address to your, um, what do you call that, to your, um, to your uh, I forgot his name, to your, uh, to your jail, uh, you add and you uh, and then you would assume that okay now both of my VMs are in the same VPC and my jails use the IP address of that VPC. Let's try pinging, regardless if it's IPv4 or IPv6, it's gonna block it because they have that. Oh, this MAC address is supposed to use the following IP address, so it becomes a problem like that. Now, one of the possible solutions to that, but that I don't like but you can, is to not use VNet, wh where uh, your jail would have an IP address, but when it goes out, it will use the MAC address of the host machine, right? If you have non-VNet jail. The interesting part is that that will also not work out of the box. You have to go to the cloud admin panel and say the VM zero, should be able to use IPA and IPB, IPA for the host, IPB for the jail. Otherwise, the switch manager of the cloud is gonna block that traffic. It's very stupid. You can see why the cloud can't actually scale there. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just very badly designed. And, and I do have to say also that Azure does have a bug where you can bypass that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the, yes, there, there's a bug and where you can bypass that security feature if you manage the headers manually, which NetGraph allows you, by the way. You can add the NetGraph hook that will modify the header. And uh, yeah, there are very interesting ways to bypass it on Azure, but all the other clouds are way more secure. Hmm. They don't allow that. So uh, I think that's a story for another day because they still had they still didn't fix the issue yet. Hmm. Uh, although they promised that they are in progress. Um, this is coming from Can a I guy jump in who... with a question? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, Don't be. Is that feasible to build, let's call it, Beehiver out of this jailer and Beehiver CTL? Or what's your thought on that? So the original code of jailer was uh, was forked kind of let's put it that way from VMB hive uh, a lot of the front end stuff is from VMB hive obviously it's not in sync anymore that was years ago uh, but I do see the value in doing that I do have to say that the only reason why we haven't created Beehiver is because my team doesn't have that much of a Beehive knowledge we are jail people after all uh, so and uh, I, I don't see any reason why not. Uh, and note that you can that. jail Beehive to some degree. And yes, exactly. You not just to some beehive. degree. Uh, you can yes. basically do everything in, from inside a jail which uh, Beehive needs if you set up the jail correctly. Your patch yes. made it in. Yeah. Yes. And and uh, um, the patch that is would just be... the cherry on top. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that would be a nice hackathon project that I can give to my university students. Tell them this is what Beehive commands are. This is what the jail commands are. This is jailer. Make it Beehive or just modify the following commands. Obviously, there's a little bit, bit more management, right? So like you need to create a ZVOL or a truncate a virtual file or, uh, you know, and stuff like that. But um, I think other than that, the rest yeah. is the same pretty much. So yeah, it would, be it would also nice be idea. probably interesting to get more information about the storage backend and uh, mm -hmm. what kind of operating system is running, yada, yada. I mean, there's probably a lot more metadata that might be interesting, particularly when you actually list what kind of things are running where. I'm One thinking the, the stuff, sorry, please go ahead. I just want to point out that one of the things that we don't like about VMB Hive is the lack of metadata. There is the data that it manages, but if you want to, let's say, uh, add a tag, I, I know it sounds like 
you know, silly, just to say like VM zero runs Windows, VM one runs FreeBSD, just a manually added tags and categories and stuff like that. It lacks. In case of Jailer, because we were just, you know, using the jailconf, we can put whatever data we want in there and we can then just parse it. And thanks to Falua, we can also parse it correctly. Like we don't have to rely on grep you know, being or giving the wrong output or whatever, but with Flua, you can write an actual parser. So, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm basically, I was also asking because I was thinking about uh, what John recently said on Beehive calls that he's facing this, you know, multitude of host systems with up to, I don't know, 30 guests uh, per host. And the trouble he has with getting an overview and keeping an overview, what is running where and migrating one guest from one host to another host. What you just showed, I think looks very much like a possible foundation to make this possible. Uh, even though um, there is no migration here with the jails, or at least I'm not seeing them. Yes. Maybe that would also be a feature that, that might be added. Oh, yes. Uh, doing a snapshot, uh, then Send receive, receive, then an other uh, snapshot, stopping it, doing a, and then doing a, basically a two pass replication so that you get everything over. And once you have everything moved over, um, the first time it will have diverged a bit, but then you stop the jail uh, and do the shutdown and an other pass to clean it up. Uh, that maybe even uh, one more pass just to basically keep the downtime uh, low. As low as possible, yes. Exactly, uh, by not stopping the jail uh, before you, uh, and then moving everything, but doing, yeah, an initial thing, then maybe another one to catch up, then stop the jail, then just the last little bit. Three rounds is probably enough for most deployments. You don't have to use more. Uh, yeah. I do have to say that, that we, I creates... can... Sorry. I can create VM CTL, which would be a, a jailer CTL style thing for VM behind, right? Their command is VM. I can create VM CTL. You run it on your Mac or Linux or Windows. Uh, or FreeBSD, if you're lucky with a good laptop, then you can, you know, do what Jailer CTL does for Jailer, but for VM Beehive, so, right? So we would have a single console to see everything. Obviously, this doesn't solve the live migration, but it would be, give a better overview of what you're running across your data center rather than so, a single machine. Regarding live migration, um, I also dismissed that for a long time, but what I finally understood is that the real problem without live migration is that you end up with hosts which are blocked by tiny workloads you can't migrate away. It may be a little VM with one core and one gig of memory and like 16 gigs of local storage, and you just can't reboot the host because you must not take down this, I don't know, this kind of lock replication daemon or some tiny little database here. And because so much software out there in the real world is sadly written under the dangerous assumption that TCP connections live forever and things are never restarted. And even application sessions live forever. And the only way to deal with, with this from a hypervisor point of view, because talking to the application people and telling them, yeah, uh, you're supposed to change your application to just reconnect quickly and not bother the user, doesn't work for most people. It would be the right design, but you can't pick the world you live in. You have to support the workloads uh, which pay your bills. So yeah, we need... Uh, well, would we need check process and... checkpointing or what to do, a, say, no, jail migration? Jails, uh, Jail migration, uh, sorry, not going to be, uh, yeah, you would need identical kernels and probably user lens to make sure. And then, yeah, you get into problems because it's really, you're right, 
talking about running a multi-kernel distributed operating system at that point, process migration and jail migration as a live migration is certainly not feasible. But the advantages jails have over virtual machines is that the restart time and mobility time can be so low that you will only lose the connection. You will mm -hmm. not, for applications which know to reconnect, you will not really notice. And for connections, in theory, yeah, well, you could have something with a proxy on both ends. Mm -hmm. And if you always proxy, the proxy could re reconnect uh, basically the sessions, but this assumes that you have a stateless protocol that okay. you can do that too. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's not uh, easy. Well, Daniel Bell made a point earlier this week that you know live migration sounds awesome but did you purchase the exact same servers to go even further than the os as you just mentioned the user yeah, landing kernel it's like well do you have exact architecture the same model potentially and the same everything and then yep great go ahead and live migrate but in the yeah, real world that's a luxury we don't always world, have uh, if you buy a, a rack of or five of identical hardware as your virtualization solution or an on-prem cloud whatever style deployment, then you do have that. You have to pl plan ahead uh, for, for storage and networking to work out correctly with live migration anyway. So it's not like you can cobble together a reasonable live migration capable infrastructure out of an assortment of random leftover old desktops. Exactly. Uh, and expect any kind of reasonable performance and correctness. Daniel, were you uh, speaking yeah. from experience and pain points there? Um, sort of. I mean, I basically had a really fancy pants cluster VMware failover. And the point was that I it fell still over? had to run. <laughs> 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 yes, actually. No, though that was that was before I realized that you need three cluster FS, including a tiebreaker, in order to make use of it at all. But um, the 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 thing was, I still had to run patches every every, you know, every quarter at, at minimum, right? So if the server is going to shut off, then a ZFS snap and move. If if, if the, when the time comes to migrate, I mean the the actual use cases of specific things coming up. We're just we're just so low that the benefits of switching uh, to FreeBSD, which is really my only choice for a, a good ZFS uh, system with hypervisor at the, at the time, was, and it's only gotten better and better and better since then. So I, I it's I, as much as I'd love to see live migration. The I mean I I did it, but I mean the the, the actual use cases where it's necessary are just, I mean, they, they exist and they're not mine. And it almost suggests your application might need to be redesigned to accommodate nodes coming and going rather than relying on the miracle of live migration. Yeah, oh, yeah you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, the chances that there's a situation where you can't have application level redundancy, which is then going to do, which is going to survive during upgrades, that is far more likely to be the thing that you, you're worrying about uh, before you worry about, uh, you know, perfect live migrations, um, you know, without without losing a ping. Um, um, anyway, I, I, I know that there are just copy? Use... Sorry. Uh, Chris, no, I was just going to say, I know there are. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether we can actually take that and copy that into the Beehive notes for tomorrow because no. um, it's one doc it's, apart. It's kinda, yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. Oh. I think it's gonna re, re. It's gonna come up again tomorrow. But okay, I, no, I, I don't want to dig too much into Beehive for today. Uh, sorry. sorry. One of the problems yeah, sorry, is Jamie. that <laughs> oftentimes the, the the boundary between hypervisor and guest is also an organizational boundary within organizations. And one of the use cases for live migration is not having to talk to an other silo. Or escape a silo you're in. Uh, uh, as in, 
I don't have to schedule with downtime or get yelled at for having rebooted their system. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, congratulations, congratulations, Daniel. I hear you liberated yourself from VMware. We can bring that up tomorrow also if you can make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Snaps pretty pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, I will admit that one of the VMware clients I fired, uh, the other one, <laughs> the other one um, that is is totally moved over. Every everything else is totally over uh, moved over to BI. Which includes at least at least a half dozen clients. Cool. Okay, we are at least at a moose jaw of an hour and a half in from Portland. Anything else? Little, a lot of good ground. Note, Go ahead. Yep. Um, I just noticed that renaming an interface finally produces a. A DevCTL message in 14.0. So you can properly respond to that. But we still don't have a good way of telling apart the messages with the VNet. So some of the messages really should carry a, the VNet name so that you know what happened there. Because I think you get a rename on the host if inside a VNet. An interface is renamed, but you don't know which VNet inside it was renamed. So it can be a bit confusing. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, but it's there, and so you can finally do something like, I don't know, uh, if you create a WireGuard interface and rename it to VPN whatever, uh, it auto loads the configuration. Yeah, that can be done now reliably, at least if you don't involve VNets. Cool. Anything else? We got a, a bit of track with regards to a service management and supervision and uh, stuff like that. Oh, yes. And uh, one more, oh, yeah. a deep dive with uh, Beehive and Jails. Um, yeah. Let's save that for tomorrow's call, but basically many hours have been put into process supervision, which is largely beehive oriented, but definitely overlaps with JL. So just no, watch the space. Uh, it has it directly applies to jails yeah. as well. Okay. Uh, especially with the lifetime problem, because normally if you spawn a jail and let the kernel reap it as soon as the last process dies, you have this desynchronization between the jail command and the real system state. Because the kernel only uh, reaps the jail, not the state created or normally torn down by the jail command. So you have this desynchronized system state now where the jail is missing, but everything else is there. Right. Mount points, uh, some kind of pit file or whatever. And process supervision really solves this. And you, we can see the difference it makes for by looking at the pod nomad driver, which allows uh, to use nomad as your cluster solution for the pod jail manager. And here the, the difference is that if you have such a thing, uh, uh, jail is no longer expected to barely demonize itself and disappear into the background. Instead, you want to have it just like with a process supervisor, so you would have for everything it stay in the foreground attached as a direct child of the supervisor, which can, for example, make the, the console output available and stuff like this. And now you have this jail under a parent process and you get to decide what you want to do. Do you want it to be persistent and basically supervise the service inside the jail? And if the service dies, you have your support process, which is probably a daemon, um, tear down the jail intentionally, uh, or what else do you want to do? There are multiple options, but that's okay. probably the most sane one. And you end up rewriting something which does most of the things the jail command does. But yeah, you 
kind of have to, and you really want the jail dot start as uh, sorry jail exec dot start equivalent to stay in the foreground under your supervisor or your cluster tool to if it's whatever it is container the uh, nomad and run for as long as you want to, and when it exits, either because you asked it to or because it crashed, or and then you want to tear down the jail intentionally and, and kill whatever processes, let's say uh, SysLogD or some other companion you did not supervise, gets killed as part of the jail as well. Yes, clean up. Keep us posted on your vision for that, okay? I'll say thank you, everyone. If you've got a last point, jump in with it. Otherwise, I'm calling it. I can be a few around a few minutes, but I've got a ton to do. Just want to thank everyone yes. for watching the demo and for the lot of feedback. You are welcome, and thank you for giving the demo. I will call it. I will wish you a great day, and I'll be around a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, guys.